The Donma produces six productions a year and we try and keep the diet of work as varied as possible. So we will look at the 20th century repertoire of plays. We, we certainly have a very strong uh, emphasis on the European repertoire. We like to do a musical. We like to do uh, the classical repertoire. And this is uh, the first Shakespeare certainly I've programmed in the five years I've been here since 2002. And, uh, it was an important moment about deciding which was the right Shakespeare to do in this very intimate surrounding. And um, the very highly domestic nature of Othello uh, l seems to lend itself beautifully to this environment. There are historically conflicts in this region around the 1600s between Islam and Christian groups, um, newly formed Christian groups. So there is a sense that actually Shakespeare's research into this time is actually very detailed and very specific. So. I think in approaching Othello, one begins from these historical points. I think it's perfect that we did it, that we've performed it in the period it was written in. I think it, it just makes it, more, for me, it's a freedom. This is where it was set, this is when it was set, and I, I felt no need to, you know, explore it in another time or place. This, these are the, Venice and Cyprus is where it's written in, in, in 1604, and it feels, feels right to me. The best thing about playing it in period is that you feel like a soldier, like a soldier from a time that doesn't, we can't really access anymore. And you've got a sword on your left and breeches and boots and you feel like a man who's used to being at sea and used to fighting and it centers you and grounds you and um, it takes you back to a different time where it feels like you experience more of the that the world was a bigger, more dangerous place. I play Othello. Um, he is a general in the Venetian army. At the beginning of the play, he's newly married to Desdemona, who is the daughter of a senator, uh, a Venetian senator, Brabantio. Brabantio himself is furious at this marriage and uh, accuses Othello of luring Desdemona uh, into his affections through witchcraft. If you look at the very first scene, he starts as a very arrogant man woken up in the middle of the night saying, I mean, come on, this is Venice. This is, don't shout at me in the middle of the night. I'm a big wig in Venice. But within a page, if you just look at the actual shape of the verse, it's all jagged and broken up because he cannot come to terms with why his daughter has gone off. At the beginning of the play, we find out that she's run off to marry him. She has eloped, so to speak, and she has uh, escaped her father's house and obviously his uh, clutches because he seems to sort of lock her up I think um, and she's run off to marry this man that she truly loves and um, she is so passionate and truthful and, and true of heart in her love that she has to choose almost between Othello and her father um, her father asks her to choose and she says, this is my husband and this is the man I'm going to follow. And this is a play that's very, very specific and detailed and, and complex and I think a character that is also so. So in approaching Othello, uh, it was important to try and get a real history for this, for this man, for this general, to get a real background. Um, and in many ways, all the clues are there. They're all in the text. The first big question to address in staging Othello in the space like this is really uh, how you're going to set it, where you're going to set it, when you're going to set it. And that process starts even before the actors come on board, really, which is with your key collaborators, designers, lighting designers, set designers, costume designers, uh, composers, and all of those people who will help create a world for the play. The play opens in Venice, and so we tried to reduce Venice down to its basic core elements, which we thought to be damp and darkness, um, the buildings being very tall, the streets being very narrow, it not being a very light city. To create the interior scenes in Venice, what we use is the idea of light coming into piercing the space. So the space remains dark, but there's shafts of light that come in very dramatically.
Christopher explored the idea of wetting, damping the whole stage uh, down at the beginning of the show. So we have a, a real stone floor which is wet. And the first time we did that, we realised that what it does is it makes the whole space feel different. The whole space feels damp and, and wet. And smells, yes. So you come into the theatre into a, a slightly dank environment. It means that it's freeing, actually, and very enlightening to, um, to belong to the era and the time that the play was written and to the history and the political situation and so on. This is a world, obviously, 16th century Venice, where there was no natural drainage, so it was a world that would have smelled. And in a space as small as this, I think the use of real elements, when an audience is physically sitting next to the stage itself and they can physically touch the floor of the stage, when they realise it is real stone and the, the stone is really damp, they get a much better sense, without having to present anything obvious and scenic at them, they get a sense that they're in a world that has these actual elements. And then what happens in the course of the play is that the floor itself dries out, and as we go from the damp environments of Venice to Cyprus, where the sun comes out, you, the floor itself kind of charts that journey. Going to Cyprus is obviously we're going to a space which is full of light and air, and uh, Christopher's designed some extraordinary elements that we can play with, but generally the piece gets much, much brighter, but through a gift from Shakespeare, which is a storm. There's a huge storm. The Turkish army is decimated. He takes over from Montano in, um, in Cyprus, and it is here that the play becomes uh, a much more domestic tragedy. Shakespeare wrote his plays to be performed without scenery and with the minimal properties and with minimal costumes. That's an approach that we've used in this particular instance. There are several instances where you need something specifically to aid the play, particularly in the final sequence, when we finally arrive in the most intimate space, which is the bedroom. And that's a very key in the narrative in terms of how we go from the very public world of Venice and the streets and the Senate to finally the play narratively ending in a bedroom. Othello is a play about army people. Um, Desdemona and Amelia are army wives of army men. And the main concern of the play is trying to depict a world where those people exist, and particularly outside of war. They hold the truth somewhere in a play that's all about lie. And how they relate to one another in this man's world, where we're surrounded by soldiers and war, you have this femininity which isn't necessarily just soft and passive, it's very, there's a strength. And, and Shakespeare writes a play that is between the fighting, if you like. The, the play starts with a very strong directive to, to fight. Uh, and then the main domestic action takes place when that is not happening. There's a strength in, 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 in Michelle Ferry's uh, Amelia that, has, uh, that, that helped me figure out who Desdemona was. She is married to Iago, who is in the army, so therefore, she has an experience of army life per se. It's her mainly women's roles in society at that time. And being a Venetian, she's Catholic. She's very Catholic, I think. And that's integral to her sense of loyalty and honor. A woman of her time could not understand that her there is no such thing as a woman being disloyal or unfaithful. Whereas if we set it in this day and age, every single woman has a knowing at 14, has a knowingness of sexual infidelity or sexual politics. So for me, al allowing the fact that this woman could be so truthful in her and courage of her convictions that nobody could possibly ever do this, you could just go, oh, come on, you know, really, that, that, she's too naive, she's too wet. But in that, setting it in that framework helped me to absolutely find the strength in her morals. Suddenly, this girl says, I'm with him, I'm not with you. He has no choice in his kind of psyche, in his persona. He can only go, God be with you. I've done. Well, Shakespeare does, he doesn't give Desdemona an easy uh, journey, I don't think. I think it's probably one of the, one of the most difficult parts I've ever played in, in, in terms of juggling um, and uh, of making somebody absolutely real because she could just be 
this very innocent, naive, young thing that just goes along with everybody and, um, and doesn't have much backbone because she isn't given much until the end. Um, she's just, everyone talks about how wonderful and truthful and lovely and honest she is and how good she is, virtuous she is. But actually, I had to find the woman in her because I'm not a 15-year-old girl. And I also had to find that um, Othello is a man. He's an articulate, strong, worldly man. And for him to fall in love with, with somebody so passionately as he does, she has to be his, his equal. And I know from my own experience of being the age I am, I've seen guys of my age, you, you, the previous generation, men who lose their wives at about my age, say, and it really is a huge loss. And I think, in a way, he's got that loss to deal with in terms of Desdemona. We believe it was first performed around 1604, and um, the costuming of uh, the, the production has come from that date. Well, there was no army in Elizabethan times. They were volunteers, and so therefore it's not so specific as it would be now. And therefore the characters become much less defined by their rank, but more by their position within the play to, relative to each other. The, the costumes you wear and the, um, and the entire feel of the production has a ring of authenticity which, um, again, is just very, uh, not only is it, it sort of enjoyable and uh, engaging, but it is enlightening and it is sort of educational. And I think an audience is just as intrigued in following the relationships of people within a historical context as they are by the plays themselves. If you set it uh, in the period it was written, it, uh, audiences are sophisticated enough, in my opinion, to be able to resonate down through the ages. And so you can, you can sit quite often watching uh, a play that is um, um, set in uh, the period it was written and think of uh, how it resonates through several hundred years between then and now. Part of the actor's job in order to play a person is to wear the clothes that they wear in the way that they would wear them so that when I'm dressing as the Cypriot gentleman I put the sword on a particular way and it gets tucked in a particular way and the sash is tied in a particular way and the cloak is worn in a particular way and the shirt is poking out the sleeve in a particular way and, and those are the choices that I imagine he makes when he puts his clothes on in the morning uh, as, as he comes out and it was very very helpful to be able to start in rehearsals wearing those clothes so by the time we actually came to the technical rehearsal we were all very familiar with them and had started to inhabit them as opposed to just wearing them. What we know from the text is that Othello has a great amount of respect and love for Iago. He believes him to be an incredibly honest man, therefore a very good soldier, a great person to work with, to fight with and so on. Iago talks about the fact that he's fought with Othello at Rhodes, at Cyprus, and on other grounds, Christian and heathen. So he's fought with Othello and many in different places in the world. And I think Iago feels very strongly that he is the natural right-hand man to Othello. However, when the position becomes free, and we don't know why it becomes free, um, he's overlooked. And Othello gives the position of lieutenant to Cassio, to Michael Cassio, much to the disappointment and fury of Iago. Iago actually misinterprets Othello's decision and Othello's decision is based on keeping a very honest man, a very good soldier in a very important position. Othello is so clever and he's such a smart man and a good warrior and leader that I think he's put Iago in the right place. He's, he's actually left Iago as his ensign because that's where Iago is best. He is good with the men, I think he's, he's good because he's, he's on a level with them He's not really officer material in the way that Michael Cassio is. And um, so I think Othello's very smart, but of course Iago doesn't think so. One of the major parts of the first half of the play in this production is, um, is in Act 3, Scene 3, where Iago, for the first time, is left alone with Othello to sow the seeds of doubt that, um, that Michael Cassio has been sleeping with Desdemona. And I think there's a racism in him as well. I mean. It's quite tricky because I really do believe it comes from a place of love, that, that Iago has loved Othello on the battlefield, that, that there's a deep connection with them because they fought together. And I think men in battle have, a, have an emotional connection with each other that I don't think you get anywhere else in the world. And I think the fact, and I think it's like being in love, and the fact that Othello's overlooked him 
It's like he smited Iago's love, and 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 from then he allows his hate to build. And part of that, I think, is the fact that he's a black man and and and, and an outsider in this in this Italian community. We have a man who is both foreign geographically, but also his ideals are foreign as well. His commitments are different. Uh, this seems to be a place to start with in terms of the, the character of Othello. In the rehearsal process for this, we've sort of tried to do something that sounds almost impossible to do with uh, a Shakespeare, uh, but we try to do it like a new play, constantly um, uh, reminding ourselves that audiences will be watching this piece um, for the first time. And if they're watching it for the first time, we sort of took on a responsibility, almost a duty, to present it as clearly uh, as it is possible to do. It feels like this relationship with Desdemona is incredibly new, so, and a new thing to him. So, uh, I think specifically in this production, what we wanted to do and wanted to try and achieve was a sense of a real genuine love, affection, trust, and a sense of this relationship being a new and very beautiful and very powerful emotion that uh, Othello is now engaged in. And how a warring man, a man used to conflict, is now pacified and is in touch with a much more delicate side to his nature. For me, in a modern day context, it's as if Cassia and Desdemona went to the same school or the same good university or something. And Othello wasn't there and Iago wasn't there, but they've known each other for a long time. They're from the same class and they're from the same world. And so therefore they can be very free with each other in a way that isn't sexually dangerous. How could possibly a young woman and a young man who are from the same age, same breeding, um, how could they just possibly love one another without there being sex involved? And uh, it's the it's the old debate, you know. Can people be friends without you know wanting to uh, without being attracted to somebody? When the seeds of doubt are planted, they hook onto an insecurity that he has, and that explodes into something else. Amelia finds the handkerchief, and it, full of good intention, intends to give it back to Desdemona, but her husband comes into the scene and takes it from her. She trusts him implicitly, so she has no idea that he is going to use it to, in any bad way at all. There's a moment where he comes back on and finds Amelia alone, and she's got the handkerchief. And um, he cracks a joke with her, I think. And I think at first I was playing it like he was just being nasty to her, but it's much more interesting to me than actual fact that they're, they're quite happy together. They're quite an odd couple, but they, I think they don't, they're not without, I think they probably, they're, they're quite well suited in a way. I don't think it's a particularly happy marriage. It's one that she has had to cope with, and he sets the rules. He starts to turn and starts to feel that something's wrong and that it involves his wife, and there's a sort of, and the green eyed monster creeps into the scene. And she has no idea what's going on, obviously, that, 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 that this is being woven behind her back. She's, she's literally just sees two people who respect and admire each other falling out, and she's just too much tries to heal it and in that is her undoing because in that Othello thinks that her loyalty is to Cassio when he has been woven the lie of that she is in love with Cassio and having an affair and being unfaithful to Othello um, which is the beginning of the unravelling of their relationship. What's interesting about playing Cassio is that you discover his insecurities as you play him and he seems to be this young alpha male on the page and he's got everything going for him. He hath a daily beauty in his life that makes Iago ugly. But when you get inside him, it, he has all these flaws and he's fallible and he's incomplete because he, he isn't yet where he wants to be in his life. He's clearly on a career trajectory and, and he can't take his drink and he loses his reputation. And it's in that reputation scene where you, you discover what he, of the most important things to himself in his life. It is his reputation. And Shakespeare's tapped into this amazing concept in humanity, I think, that 
as human beings, all we have is our reputation, and that's our legacy, and he loses it. It's simply to do with his jealousy, which is what the play is all about, and his ability to hate, and, and I think the, the, the power he feels from being able to manipulate people. Everything he does in the play works till the end. Everything he puts into action comes out to his betterment. Everyone, he manages to make everyone jealous of everyone else very easily, and I think he, he gets carried away with the power because he feels that he should be higher up in society and he should have a better position than he does. The fact that he's able to destroy Othello and his relationship with Desdemona and, and kill Rodrigo, it's just like he's on a mad power surge. He can't believe his, um, he gets carried away with it all, I think. So, within this, what Shakespeare's constructed is this incredibly powerful longing and hatred and jealousy and fury and love and, uh, and everything is feeding into each other um, for this one night which should be this incredibly passionate night but actually has always been interrupted to the point where now it is, um, it is violent and vengeful. While there is this quartet of key individuals at the center of the story, the center of the narrative, Othello, Iago, Desdemona, Emilia, um, the smaller characters are hugely important in the, in, in the narrative. And we were keen with uh, the Rodrigos, uh, the Cassios, uh, all of those parts to also bring out their story as strongly. And that during the rehearsal process was also a key part of what we were trying to do with this particular production. A remarkable, remarkable piece of writing because in three short and rather swift scenes, Shakespeare gives you uh, the building blocks for quite a complicated and complete person. I mean, you don't find those straight away. I was still finding things out like the other night we were doing the scene in the Senate where Desdemona refers saying, listen, I'm disobeying you because I'm obeying my husband just as my mother disobeyed her father to obey you. And suddenly there's a point of, hang on, where is Mrs. Brabantio? Where is her mother? Of course, she's not there. Has she just died recently? And suddenly there was a, a sense in, in playing inside Brabantio, oh my God, has my wife just recently died and now I'm losing my daughter as well? When I first read the play, um, I read the notes in the beginning of the play and it said that Paul Schofield played him as a man that Iago needed to shut up instead of, a, of what's been done since then, which is more of a foil or a gull and concentrating on that. And uh, with the director, Michael Grandage, um, we decided to go down that road to make him into a romantic hero to try and give him some dignity. Because no man's born an idiot. They're made into idiots by other people. So he's just a man who's in love and um, passionately in love. It's really interesting how late in the play Bianca comes into the scene, on, onto stage. Um, as an actor, I find it interesting to listen to the play for the whole evening. I can't not be part of what was happening before because you get very much the energy of what's going on and that informs the world of that night's performance. Every night is different in some way. Um, and I, it's interesting that I, I can feel the surprise as, as I come on stage. You know, people sort of go, oh, there's this new person, a new energy. And I, I, don't, I don't know why Shakespeare's chosen to do that. I feel it's quite a powerful position to be in. It's a big statement made in a very short space of time. You know, so it's a brief but beautiful part. Um, and, and I think it, it's that, as someone who's on the periphery of this world that has become so enmeshed, it's this little nest of vipers, and, and she comes in and reminds us of what they were doing before. I feel very much that Shakespeare wrote an ending for Iago's story, that there's, the audience are left in no doubt that he's gonna be taken away and tortured horribly and killed eventually, uh, but, Whereas everyone on stage and everyone in the auditorium want an explanation. They want him to tell us, why did you do these terrible things? And Shakespeare's uh, not allowed that. He's, he's denied the audience and the characters an explanation from Iago, who simply says, from this moment forth, I never will speak word. He says, I'm not going to say anything else ever. And um, I think it's brilliant, because there is no, there can be no 
rational explanation as to why somebody would do these things. And, and certainly, if they're motivated by love, which I think they probably are, and a kind of smiting of his love that he feels for Othello, it's not something that Iago would like to share with a group. <laughs>